Welcome to Living the New Life with Valentine Okeke. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We will simply continue this morning from where we stopped. You know, we've been talking about obtaining the best from God. And we said that for you to obtain the best from God, there are some facts that must be settled. The first is that you must come to terms with the fact that God knows the best. Not only that he knows the best, he has the best. And above all, he wants us to have the best. Once we come to terms with that simple fact, then that will make all the difference in our relationship with him. And we said that for us to be able to obtain the best from God of necessity, there are some principles that we must have to abide by. There are some principles that we must have to learn. There are some principles that we must have to put in practice for us to be able to obtain the best from God. And we said that the first principle is for us to sincerely desire to please God. That is the first principle. There must be this sincerity to want to please God. That's the number one principle. Then we said that number two principle is that we should desire the best from God and accept nothing less. Then number three, we said we have to focus on Jesus because he is the author, the finisher, and the perfecter of our faith. Then we said that number four is that we should meditate on the word of God day and night so that we will be able to observe everything that is written in the word. By so doing, we'll be able to make our way prosperous and we'll be able to have good success. Then number five, we said we must endeavor to make the Holy Spirit our best friend because he is the one that our Lord and Savior has sent to be with us. He said that he will reveal all things to us because he is the spirit of truth. He is the only one that understands the mind of the Father. And because he has the attribute of being omnipotent, omniscience, and omnipresent, we have a good friend in him. So all our activities should be to draw closer and closer and closer to him. That as we do that, we will get to know the mind of God. Then number six, that we should desire to hear and obey promptly the voice of God. And I said that the starting point in doing this is by studying the Word of God, cultivating the habit of studying the Word of God on a daily basis. Because God and His Word are one. The will of God has been revealed in the Bible. So when we live with a closed Bible, invariably we are living with a closed heaven. Most of the things that we need that will help us to lead a godly life, the mind of God concerning many issues and situations and principles are already revealed in this book. So this book is not meant for the shelf. This book is meant for our hearts. And it's only through meditation that we can get the contents of this book into our hearts. And when we do that, the Holy Spirit being a quickening spirit, when it comes, it will quicken the word of God that is in our heart to use in a addressing any adverse situation that is facing us. So the first point of hearing from God is through his word. When you cultivate the habit of studying this word daily, you will notice that a day or times will come when the very promises here will jump off the page 
And that is what we call Rema. And speak to you as though God is standing there speaking to you. So it's very important. So the starting point is his word. When we cultivate the habit of relating with his word, then if there are any other things, I can assure you that God will always speak to you and reveal those things to you. But if you've not laid the solid foundation based on his word, many of his guidance, references, will be based on his spoken word. If you've not done that as a habit, I'm afraid you might not be able to hear any further thing from God. Then number seven, we said that we must take heed what you hear and how you hear it. Jesus said that because what you hear affects your heart. We are told that the heart does not grieve of what the ear did not hear. So it's important the kind of things that we lend our ears to. We must test whatever is coming to our ears, just like you test your food. When you test a fruit and it's bitter, what do you do naturally? You throw it away. Likewise, you must test every word that is coming to your ears. If it doesn't line up with the principles laid down in the word of God, you throw it off. Then he said, take heed how you hear. The attention you pay, the concentration you pay to what you hear drives the thing straight into your heart. So if you open your ears to gossip and create enough room and realization for gossip, then it will affect you negatively. There is no two ways about it. So God expects us to pay very close, keen attention to everything. To take heed means for you to listen with every attention with the objective of obeying all the details contained in what you have heard. That's what is meant to take heed. Okay? So you take heed to what you hear and how you hear it. Then number eight, we said we'll focus on eternity. Make heaven your goal. When you focus on eternity, he helps you to take care of the pressures of this life. And also, it helps you to trust God the more. Because he said, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And every other thing will be added unto you. He said, your father already knew that you have need for all these things. But when you make heaven your primary objective, your primary goal, he said, oh, every other thing will be added. That means that heaven must be first. Every other thing must be second. So we must make heaven what? Our priority. That is the key. So with that, a lot of things will not bother you. You see some people, they bother about the things they wear. A lot of people get into trouble because of fashion. But guess what? Fashion changes every other second. There is a friend of mine who says that Japan does not sleep. Initially, I didn't understand what he was saying. <laughs> so I now asked him, what do you mean that Japan does not sleep? He said, every time they are busy inventing new things. So as you're getting crazy about a particular thing, and you're tearing yourself apart, something better than that one will come up. If it's heard you, while you're struggling with the weapon, they will bring out uh, natural human hair. As you're struggling with that one, they will bring out uh, horse hair. 
As you're struggling with that one, they will bring out donkey's hair. You know, all kinds of things coming up. So you don't need to bother about those things. But, you see, when you make heaven your focus, you know one thing that will come to terms? That death is inevitable. And when you die, even the wristwatch that you're wearing, that they use to decorate the person, once it's time to close that casket, they will say, remember, remember to bring up. Even the trinket they use in decorating, remember to remove it. Everything is remember, remember, remember. So you will be lucky. And even the dress that they are putting on on you is, if you have seen them, so the dress, if it's shut, the back is opened. Uh, the, the, the sleeves are all open. They will just tuck it in. So you don't even wear anything complete any longer. Because you see, once the person is stiffened, there is no way you can put on any dress, any clothing. So why should we disturb ourselves so much? And guess what? At the end of the day, this flesh you're seeing is manure. So why should you bother giving the tamai so much food to eat? So it makes no economic sense, except for fertilizing the soil. Fine, you can be as big as you want. But that's one aspect. The second aspect is, oh, you see the ladies, uh, this, the, the, the cream that I use is from France. This one will say, oh, it's from Greece. This one will say, oh, it's the original oil from Egypt. You know, all kinds of things. They want to tune up their skin. There is nothing wrong with that. But don't go and kill yourself about those things. Are you following? You see a lot of people go out of their way and do some crazy things just for those things. And our Heavenly Father is saying, those things are not the most important things. The things that you really need, I know about them. I've provided for them. And I want you to have them. So that's it. So when we make heaven our focus, eternity our focus, there are a whole lot of things that will not... You see, when you talk about peer pressure, it's just for people that put their eyes on things. I don't see why any child, why any young person should be subjected to that kind of pressure. Because, you see, your standard is not based on people. Your standard is based on Christ. When you make Christ your standard, you have nothing to worry about. He is the one that will give approval. And besides that, you cannot change any other thing. Highest you will go for plastic surgery. We know of that great musician that did, how that complicated all his life, and with all his money, he died very young. So, if your nose is not pointed, just leave it. Yeah? If you're not too tall, don't bother about the high heels. With our bad roads, you wear the high heel, you fall from that high heel, you end up in the orthopedic, and before you say Jack, they will complicate issues for you, and so on and so forth. So what am I saying? Be contented with whatever God had put before you, especially if it has to do with your physique. Accept yourself and be grateful the way you are. Don't go and start adding and removing. So long as you're faithful to God, he will always cause you to obtain the best. Hallelujah. Then we said, allow God to choose for you. That's number nine. Why? Because everything lies naked before him. He understands everything. He knows the very thoughts. He said, I know the plans that I have for you plans for good and not for evil, 
because I have an expected future for you. He said, my plans for you are for good and not for disaster. So when you allow God to choose for you, then you can be rest assured. He said, this day have I set before you blessings and causes. He didn't stop there. He now advised us, he said, choose blessings. Because he is quite conscious of the fact that there is every tendency that will make the wrong choice. And even at that, he said, I have also made a way of escape. So if you come to me, even when you have missed it, I'm going to show you the way of escape. Why is our Heavenly Father making those precious promises to us? He said, because there is a path, paths that seem right before every man, but it leads to what? To death. What is death? Death is a negative principle of life. It doesn't simply mean the termination of life. It means negative principle of life. That's what death is all about. And that's why Christ said, I've come to give you life and to give you abundant life. Abundant life simply means you having the best from God. Then we said that number 10 is that you keep abiding, you keep asking, and you keep advancing. So for you to keep abiding simply means that you get connected to the vine. Because Christ said that without me you can do absolutely nothing. So when you realize that without him you will not be able to achieve anything, then it's our responsibility to attach ourselves to him. And how do you do that? He said, in all things, acknowledge me. In, did he say some things? In all things, that means that God expects you to mention everything that you're doing. And he made a promise. He said, I will direct your path when you do that. Why did he say we should keep asking? When is the same God that said that I already know what you need? In asking, you keep the communication line open. In asking, what do you do? You keep the communication line open. That's the essence of continually asking. And he said, when you do those two things, you will keep advancing because he made a promise, I will move you from glory to glory to glory to glory. Anything that has to do with God must have an element of growth in it. Anything that you're doing that does not have an element of growth, check it out, my dear. Do you know why? It is only the devil that will want to start something today and finish it the next second. But when God is leading you, there must be an element of growth. There must be a seed that you have to sow, that will have to germinate, that will have to grow before producing the fruit. There is always a gestation period when you're dealing with God. If you want a child, when the sperm touches the egg and fertilizes it, what happens? It stays nine months after which the growth process will start until you get to this point. But if you permit the devil, he will produce a human being full grown, bam, like that, in one second. That's why we are told that ill-gotten wealth brings sorrow to the family. Quick gains bring disaster. But that wealth that grew, he said his blessings are without any sorrows added to it. So anytime you find yourself on that fast lane, know that something is wrong. Be careful. Retreat. And take it easy. So, those are the ten principles. And we've already dealt with the first one, 
that has to do with sincere desire to please him. So this morning we're going to look at the second principle briefly. And I said that that second principle is we should desire the best from God and accept nothing less. By extension, do you realize that there is a universal principle that makes it possible for you to order your harvest in advance? Do you know what that universal principle is? Sowing and reaping. That means whatsoever you desire, all you need to do is to get the seed and sow it. If I want friends, what do I do? I make myself friendly. And one of the seeds of friendship is smiling. When you begin to smile, you begin to sow the seed of friendship. But if every time you frown your face, what will you achieve in doing? You scare people away from you. Smile is attractive. So when you sow the seed of smile and laughter, People want to come around you. When you want friends, you sow the seed of sincerity. When people know you're sincere, they want to deal with you. When you want friends, you sow the seed of faithfulness. When people know that you're faithful, they will trust you with things. And that's why the Bible says, who can find a faithful worker? The seed of kindness is that seed that sees the need in someone else's life. And the seed of goodness is that hand that stretches out to help. That leg that goes the extra mile to visit. That tongue that comforts, not the one that runs people down. That is the tongue of goodness. Gentleness is a seed. If you want to make yourself friendly, you can sow the seed of gentleness, bringing all your strength under control and making yourself, putting yourself at others' disposal, trying to attend to their needs. What of that of self-control? You're in a position to do somebody in, but you restrain yourself. You control yourself. Many of us get into trouble today with our health because of what we consume. Self-control. You restrain yourself. You know that once you take that piece of meat, it's enough for you, irrespective of the fact that they have one bowl of it. <laughs> you see people in funerals, they will drink beer. If they bring beer, they bring the local palm wine, they will drink. They bring whiskey, they will drink. They bring wine, they will drink. It's lack of self-control. So they are all seeds that we can sow. But God says that desire the best. What do you think is the best that God has for us that we should all desire at all times? What do you think is the best that God had kept for his children that he wants us to operate in at all times in our lives? The best that God has for his children is love. And for you to obtain love, 
from him. You must sincerely submit yourself to the control of the Holy Spirit. We are told in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, that when the Holy Spirit controls your life, he will produce this fruit in you, the fruit of love. And when that fruit is produced, it will express or manifest itself in joy, in peace, in patience, in kindness, in goodness, in faithfulness, in gentleness, and in self-control. And I said that when these attributes of love is being produced in a man or a woman's life, no matter the situation that you're facing in life, one of these attributes will at the nick of time prop up to address that challenge or that need that you're facing. Many young girls have gotten into trouble because of lack of patience. The parents are saying, hold on, my daughter. Let's observe this young man that is coming into your life. So no, mom, you don't understand. Oh, daddy, you're too tough on me. Hold it. Give us some time. Let's make inquiry about the background of this young man. Oh, no, 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 no. Can't you see he's handsome and tall, energetic? For the young man, take it easy. Give us time to make inquiries. That's why in Igbo land, when you come back home with a wife from township, they will know that something is wrong with your head. They will ask you, your mother, did your father find her in the township? That was in those days anyway. Do you know why? Because the background from where any person comes affects and influences that person's life. There are things that run in the gene. Stealing runs in the gene. But again, some of those terrible vices, they run in the gene. Madness runs in the gene. Which other one? Anger runs in the gene. Short life runs in the gene. Those are some of the things that they will go and inquire to find out what runs in the gene. Even this gossip runs in the gene. Not staying in one place runs in the gene. There are some people that are always on the move. It runs in the gene. Ah, they are always on the move. These things run in the gene. So they want to find out. Even prostitution runs in the gene. But you say, no, I must marry her. In fact, that day I've even gone to the registry. If your parents are wise, they will just smile and wish you well. But I can assure you, in many cases, in less than two, three years, you see the young man coming back like uh, a chicken beaten by a fox. Not to worry, you start all over again. But by that time, you have lost precious time. 
That same time you were not prepared to sacrifice in the beginning. Maybe then he could have taken them higher six months, one year, to make all the necessary inquiries and the prayers. Now you're going to wait five years. Not only that, you've already signed up something that will follow you to your grave. So that's what we are talking about. So the best that God has for his children is for him to give you the heart of love. We should sincerely desire it. Many of us will want the gift of prophecy, the gift of healing, the gift of faith. Guess what? All those gifts are temporary. You only need them in this planet Earth. After which, in heaven, you don't need all those gifts. The only gift that you need that continues to eternity is what? The gift of love. So in summary, love is the basis of all positive action. I want you to take note of it. That love is the basis of all positive action. We should sincerely desire that at all times our heart should be filled with the love of God. When your heart is filled with the love of God, it takes care of natural human stress. Because it makes you selfless and takes away that sinful nature of selfishness that is the cause of human failures. All shortcomings are born from selfishness. And guess what about selfishness? Selfishness is inborn and inherent because of our fallen human nature. So even a newborn baby is selfish to the core. The very moment that baby comes out from the womb, what's the first reaction? Begins to cry, yeah, 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 disturbing the peace of everyone. That newborn baby doesn't care what silence that you need. All that baby is saying, you have taken me away from the comfort of the womb. This air that I'm breathing now, I don't like it, it's polluted. And I'm also hungry. And I'm, I'm not sure whether you're going to breastfeed me or not. Or whether it will be as tasty as the one that I've been enjoying in the womb. Nah, nah, nah. Then the next thing he begins to toilet and urinate. Nah, nah, nah. I'm wet. Change me. Newborn baby. You parents, you know what I'm talking about. All through the night, no sleep. Because that's when the baby is active. Because the night is about the only time that presents the environment close to what the baby is used to in the womb. So it begins to disturb everyone. It doesn't care whether you have to go to work or not. Is that not selfishness to the core? <laughs> so where did the baby learn that? It's already in our fallen human nature to be selfish. So the highest thing that God will do for you is to give you a heart of flesh. That should be our greatest desire. When you have a heart of flesh, selflessness is what it produces. 
At all times, you're putting others before you. At all times, you're overlooking their faults and mistakes and reaching out to their knees and lifting them up. That's what I'm talking about. So the greatest desire of our hearts to be to have that heart of flesh, a heart that can continually surrender to the perfect will of the Father, a heart that can continually say, nevertheless, irrespective of what I'm thinking concerning this situation, irrespective of what this guy has done to me, Father, this is what you want, and that's what I'm going to do. When you have that kind of attitude towards God, you're sowing the best, and you're going to obtain the best from him. And that's when he made that promise in Psalm 32, verse 8. He said, I'm now going to guide you along the best pathway for your life. He didn't stop there. He said, I will advise you. That means I'm going to be your advisor. He didn't stop there. He said, I will also watch over you. That means I will protect you to make sure that you are continually a fit instrument in my hands. That is what it's all about. That is what love is all about. Surrendering your heart to him so that that exchange will take place. He will take the stony heart away from you, grant you a heart of flesh. With a heart of flesh, you will now be able to be responsive to his guidance then you'll be responsive to his advice. And when he's protecting you and telling you, don't go out, you want to sit down. Many people have gotten into trouble, not because God did not warn them. Don't attend that meeting or that party. Oh, but I promised them that I'm coming. Then you go, you run into trouble. And somebody will sit around and say, oh, why is it that God did not protect this person? But little will you know that God had already warned the person not to go out. But because of the promise he or she had made to the friends, you step out and you run into trouble. So it's important that on our own part, we desire the best from him, and the best that we can ever desire from God is that heart of flesh, a heart that is responsive to his perfect will, a heart that can say, nevertheless, not my will, because at all times, you have the final say as to what you do. And because you have the final say, and God had given you a gift of choice that you can decide what you want, he will never infringe on that gift. That is why life is all about choices. The choice that you make today will tomorrow make you. Wisdom demands that at that point, you get to know the mind of God. You seek for his advice. Then you now obey him. But when God makes his mind available to you, and you choose not to obey him, what do you think will happen? You will see miss it. So desiring the best from him and not accepting anything less puts a responsibility on us. And that responsibility is that we must sow the best at all times. And the best that we can sow is to 
Allow love to guide every action of ours. When you do that, oh, the kind of peace that you will begin to enjoy. Because at that point, you're no longer doing your own thing. Everything you're doing, you want to please him. Can you see how the first and the second principle work together? There are two sides of the same coin. A sincere desire to please him, then a desire to get the best from him. And the only way you can get the best is to sow the best. And that's why we are told that whatsoever you make happen for people, God will make happen for you. That is the principle. It's the principle of sowing and reaping. If you check every activity in life, it obeys that simple principle of sowing and reaping. So that means I can order my harvest in advance. Whatsoever I need, all I need to do is to get to know the seed and sow it and be patient. That seed will germinate with the right environment. As you nurture it, it will grow and it will bear fruit. The devil cannot stop it. Because it's a universal law that is guiding the activity of every human being. You must sow before you reap. You change the order, you run into trouble. Some people want to reap before they sow. That is 419. And when you do that, you definitely get into problem. So this morning, our prayer this morning, my dear ones, is for us to grant us a heart of flesh. God had not given us the spirit of fear or intimidation. He said, I've given you the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of sound mind. Why the spirit of love? Because without his love, you cannot obtain anything of value from him. Because God is love. And he desires that his children emulate him and be like him. Why? We have been created in his own image and likeness. Can a monkey beget a dog? Are you sure that an elephant cannot give birth to a cow? So if God had created us in his own image and likeness, and we are told that God is love, that means that we are also love. Number one is that we are the object of his love. And he expects us to receive his love and pass it out. Receive his love and do what? What do you have? Cross. So we must always visit the cross if we want to succeed in anything that we're doing. We must take from the Father and disseminate it. We take from him, we we'll let it flow. We take from him, we we'll let it flow. That is what the cross is all about. The cross is all about love. And that was why Christ was able to say, Father, forgive these people for they don't know what they are doing. And when he said that, he said it is finished. That means that every requirement that you guys need to succeed in life have now made it available on this cross. And what he accomplished on that cross was the heart of love. It takes the heart of love for you to forgive your enemies. That's why we have the law of forgiveness and love. It only applies to the cross. In that cross, you will see that law, that law being demonstrated. The law of forgiveness and what? And love. Can we all stand? Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. 
Venue is at the Seven Option Parks, Ladoke Akintola Boulevard, opposite Caribou Hotel, Gerki Abuja. God bless you.